Will the Scolari family please come forward and light our Advent candle and our Christ candle. Today, we light the first four candles, and we also light the center white candle. The first Sunday, we lit the candle of hope. The second Sunday, we lit the candle of peace. The third Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. And the fourth Sunday, we lit the candle of love. Today, we light the Christ candle. The, this candle represents Jesus. When we light this candle, we remember Jesus' birth. Our waiting has ended. at the center candle, we remember that God sent Jesus to give us hope, peace, joy, and love to all people. Outside of Bethlehem, the shepherds saw a great light and heard the voices of angels. They traveled to the manger and saw baby Jesus. Far away in Be from Bethlehem, three wise men saw a, a star in the sky. They followed the star and were filled with joy when they found Jesus. They they remind us that the gift of Jesus was not for the people in one place, but for all people. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus for all people, not just those in one place at one time. On this Christmas Eve, help us remember and rejoice again because Jesus was born. May we live every day remembering your love and care and showing that love and care to others. Amen. as you're able and join with me in our opening hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful, number 233, verses 1 through 4, and then 6.
Amen. You may be seated. Merry Christmas. We are so, so very happy to have you here worshiping tonight at East Heights, where we love God, love neighbor, and serve our world. We hope that you'll help us remember that you're here by signing in on the postcard that was in your bulletins tonight. You can just leave it in your pew when you're done or drop it into one of the offering baskets as you leave. And if you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. We hope that you will make a comment in our comment section so that we can know that you are also joining us. Tonight we'll be partaking in communion, and so if you haven't picked up your communion elements, or if you haven't picked up one of the candles, because at the end of the service we will be having a candle lighting service, please just raise your hand. We have ushers who are ready right now to come and help you if, if you need that. We want to thank those of you who um, helped to make our sanctuary beautiful with our poinsettias. If you purchase one and purchased one in advance and would like to take it home tonight after the service, you are welcome to do so. If you would like to help us get these poinsettias that are left to our shut-ins and those in the nursing homes, you can stop here at the communion rail, um, choose an address that you want to take one to, take a plant, and help us get those to them, and that would be just wonderful. Let us now join our hearts together with our Christmas prayer. With joy and thanksgiving, we gather tonight as your people. We have come to hear again the timeless story of Christ's birth. In the excitement of this night, quiet our hearts that we may experience your presence and know your love in this holy time. May your light shine in the darkness of our world. May your peace comfort us as we seek you in this moment. We pray all of this in the name of your Son. Amen. The following is an account of the Christmas story as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let us sing now, Away in the Manger. We'll sing the first verse, hymn number 217. The reading continues at the eighth verse. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. 
Let us now sing together the first verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We conclude our reading of Jesus' birth with Luke's account in chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one, or one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Now let us sing together, Angels We Have Heard on High, verse 1. Friends, you might have heard earlier that our congregation seeks to love God, to love our neighbor, and then be in service to the world. And I'm so grateful to be a part of a congregation that seeks to put those words into action. And then one of the ways that we did that was yesterday, as part of our Joy of Giving Week, we went out to the Dillons on, on Douglas and Hillside, and we shared a little joy. We went out and uh, we ha hired a uh, coffee truck uh, for espressos and baked goods to be provided to the workers at Dillons. Now, these are some folks that otherwise don't get noticed. They're on the front lines providing food and, and our prescriptions. Uh, and we wanted to say we appreciate you and show a little joy in this season. So I invite you to take a look at this video that gives you a picture of what we did on that Thursday. Let's take a look. Oh, I love this because we really work so hard to take care of our customers and to love people, my personal feeling. And this is such a treat and such a blessing for me today. I love this. This is just amazing. 
I tell you, it's been a wonderful day. The weather's been just perfect for it. But watching people come in shop, getting ready for Christmas, and putting smiles on their faces here, having a free donut, having a free cup of coffee, and that's it. And it's just like, that's it? Yeah, just have it. Enjoy yourself and shop and enjoy the wonderful holiday season. And that was the Joy of Giving Week, a part of it, where we went out and tried to live it out, out of that call to love God, to love neighbor, and serve the world. You know, if you're a guest here with us, we're so glad you're here. And in a moment, we're going to have an offering. And this is where we uh, use some of our financial resources to support the ministries of our church, to continue to share the love of Jesus in very real and practical ways. We do this through worship and service and care for others. And so if you're online or in person, you can go to our website and you can make your gift there or you can drop it off in the receptacles in, in the narthex or to my right here. If you choose to give, thank you so much for your support of our church and its mission. I invite you to listen now and just uh, feel and experience this next musical selection and then give as you're able. Thank you so much. as you're able for our doxology.
Holy God, we take this moment to thank you for the many ways you have blessed our lives. And we thank you in this moment for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, we ask that you bless this offering and all of us here as we seek to be faithful to you, Lord. And we lift up our prayers now in Jesus' name. And together we say amen and praise God. You may be seated. past month, members of our congregation, along with followers of Jesus from around the world, have been engaged in a, a time of preparation for this day as we celebrate and, and prepare our spirits to uh, come to this po point, this moment where we, we anticipate the coming of Christ on Christmas morning. And we've been centering our time around the four themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, and love. And today we're going to talk about the, the, the promise that God is with us, that God is with us even in the most difficult moments of our lives. You know, Christians believe that Jesus is God's one and only Son. This is known as the incarnation. And this means that God was in the world in the actual person of Jesus of Nazareth. God's Son has many names and titles, and each of these names and titles gives us special insight and special understanding into His presence and purpose in our lives and in our world. Now, have you ever given much thought to your name and how you got your name, uh, why your parents uh, named you who you are? You know, names have uh, importance, and they give us a sense of who we are and who our, uh, our parents hope we would become. You know, my name is Stephen. That's my given name, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. And uh, my, I'm named after uh, my mom's first cousin. Now, in my family, uh, it didn't matter who they were. If they were a member of the family and older than, than you, you were either an uncle or an aunt. It just simplified everything or made it very uh, difficult and complicated. But I had an Uncle Steve who was my fifth cousin or something, who knows, right? But, but I was named after him because my mom uh, appreciated him. They, they were good friends growing up, and she wanted me to have his name to carry it on. Now, Stephen means crowned one. And it also, uh, Stephen was the first martyr that we find in the uh, book of Acts, who was the first one to die for proclaiming Christ. Now, my son's name is Sean, and that means crowned one. And Anna and I uh, were thinking of a name, and when we landed on, on Sean, that was the one we knew would be for him. Now, my daughter Casey is named uh, because uh, Casey in Irish is, means brave. And so when we saw that, we said, yeah, that's, our, that's the name for our girl. And maybe you as parents have thought, had that kind of thought about your, the names for your children. 
and, and you had, had a name that it was passed down from family members uh, or a name that was uh, a part of uh, somebody that was very special to you. I, I forgot to add that my son's name, Sean, was uh, also named after a good friend of mine who was uh, a buddy of mine in the Air Force, and then later uh, he was my best man in our wedding. So I believe that names that we're given have a purpose and meaning. They, they add to the texture of our lives and who we're called to be. You know, God's son has, was referred to by many names. His parents called him Jesus. Others called him Messiah, Lord and Savior, Light of the World, the, world, the Word Made Flesh. I believe each of these titles help us to understand who Jesus is and the reason we celebrate his birth in this moment. One of the names that I have come to truly appreciate is Jesus as Emmanuel. That means God is with us. Christmas, friends, is a special time of year, not only for the joy it brings to children or the opportunity it gives us to be kind to others. I believe that Christmas is a special time because it reminds us that on a cosmic level and then on a very personal uh, level that God is with us in the moments of our lives, in the highs and the lows and in the in-betweens. And I believe this is important because at the very core of who we are, we need to know that we're not alone that we're loved, and that someone is with us, carrying us through no matter what we're going through. I wonder if you might think of a time when you were especially alone, where you felt so isolated. I can remember a time myself. It was when I was basic, in basic training in the Air Force. I was at Lackland Air Force Base, and there was about 70 guys in the dorms that I was at. And there was uh, um, airmen that were in a lot of these dorms around uh, at Lackland. And, and when we went to sleep at night, it got very quiet. Sometimes you'd hear somebody crying in the, in the distance, but it was uh, very quiet. And when you were going to sleep, I felt that, that feeling of loneliness and isolation. I was in a crowd of 70 other guys. Uh, all of us were in it together. But for that moment, I felt totally alone. Maybe you felt alone like that and isolated yourself. It might have been uh, as a child when you're going to a new school, you had no friends, you were in the lunchroom or something and had nobody to sit with. It might have been going to college and, and uh, stepping out on your own. You know, I can remember some times when I'd be in a, a new uh, dorm room in an unfamiliar setting, lying down to go to sleep and realizing it was just me. You know, one of the things that was so important in those moments was that I would be sent, uh, sent cards and letters from friends and family. My mom and my grandmother would send me cards to remind me that they were thinking about me, they love me, and that they were proud of me. Those little notes, those little cards made a big difference. It let me know that I wasn't alone and that I was loved. You see, I believe that on a deep level within us, we all need to be supported and connected with one another. We need our family and our friends uh, to remind us that we're not alone. But truly, I believe that uh, we also need to know that God loves us and that God seeks us out and has a plan and purpose for our lives. You see, friends, the promise of Christmas is that Jesus came into the world as our Emmanuel, God with us. And Emmanuel is a Hebrew word, a Hebrew name which served as a sign from God to his people. Now, in a sense, God with us is the, the story of Scripture. You can go from the Old Testament all the way through and we'll see evidence of God with us. God was with us uh, in the story of Genesis to Revelation. He was with Adam and Eve in the garden. God was uh, with Abraham, Moses, and David. He was with Christ even at the cross. Now in the Old Testament, the name that was given for the child uh, as a sign to Judah when they were being threatened by armies surrounding them, they were, they were promised that God would be with them, that Emmanuel would be their sign, that they were not alone, that they weren't forsaken. And Isaiah says this in chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. He says, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child 
She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so the sign of Emmanuel in this context was a short-term sign of hope for the people of Judah. That as the, per, the uh, um, armies that were surrounding them uh, threatened their lives, that God would guide them through it. And this was just a short-term message that God was with them. But the gospel writers took a larger perspective on this, a, a, a cosmic perspective. And they believed that, that within the prophecy that God had a larger sign in mind. The ultimate sign of God's love and presence, his plea, peace and power culminates in the life of Jesus. God's relationship with us is a distinctive aspect of all who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. You see, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he had this message for his followers. He said at the end of Matthew, he said, even uh, know this, be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. In a letter to the community of believers in Ephesus, which is modern day Turkey, Paul uh, the apostle tried to take in this truth that Christ is with us. And in this letter, he was talking to a people, and he wanted to give them the sense of the mystery of God being with us in this moment. Not only for the people in that day, but this is a promise and a prayer for you and I today. So hear it in this moment with that sense that God is with you. Here Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, 14 and 21. He said, when I think about all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him and the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Friends, in this passage, Paul says that believers would find strength in God's presence. That Jesus would be at home in their hearts and that they would come to understand the depth of God's love for each one. First, Paul prayed that God would strengthen the inner being of the person, of the believer, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Here in Ephesians, Paul urges the believers and you and I to have faith in this higher vision, a deeper perspective. Those who have such faith do not need to be afraid because we can trust to know that God is with us and we can face the uncertainty of the future because we're not alone. And God is working a way through no matter what we're dealing with in life. This is a promise. Second, the Apostle Paul prays that Christ will dwell or make his home. I love that image, that he will dwell within us, that he will make his home in our hearts, in our lives. There's an intimacy there, a connection. A God wants to be with us. And finally, he prays that we could somehow understand the fullness of God, the richness of the Lord, and the love of Christ, even though that love surpasses knowledge. It's to the point that Paul couldn't even express it. He had to go to, to dimensions because words fall short. Paul saw the cross as the supreme expression or revelation of God's love for us. And this is the love he wanted his readers and you and I to know, this boundless love. Going even deeper and, and beyond death to a new life and a new relationship. This is what the cross means. That no matter what we've done in the past, no matter how messed up our lives are, that Christ can make a way. And he did. 
He lived, died, and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. This is a, a promise for each one of us, even on this day. And it's overwhelming to consider that the one who was sinless, who did no wrong, would sacrifice all for you and I. That is the reason Paul could not finish the, the description he started. It, love was so incredible, it defies description. It goes beyond fully understanding it. God, the creator of the universe, is with you. Chose to come down to be with us in the mess and the challenges, the heartache and the sorrow. And I appreciate this message that God isn't up here distant, looking down almost without care about what's going on in our lives. God came to be with us. And this is what we celebrate uh, at Christmas, that God broke through and seeks to carry us through. What's incredible about Manuel is that God didn't pick the good neighborhoods to move into. He went to a backwater town and he, and he engaged two peasant people that were faithful to him. And they were the parents of Christ. Friends, this is a reminder that, that God doesn't pick favorites. He seeks the least, the left out, and the lost. I wonder if we often have this picture that we need to get our acts together, that we need to clean up our lives before we come to church, before we start engaging in this relationship with Jesus. I know that when I was first taking those steps to faith, I was in the Air Force in my early 20s, and I said, well, you know, uh, I'll stop cussing, and then I'll get back to church. Well, if we all had to do that, forget it. Nobody would be here, right? Or I'd have to do this or this or this, and then I could come to church. But one of the things that I appreciate, uh, uh, that Jesus welcomes us where we're at and leads us to where we need to go. And that's a good message, a good word for each one of us here. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have it all together. If we allow Christ to move and be active and have a home in our lives, he can transform us to change who we are and how we live and respond. We can become more like him, a people of love and faith, kindness and generosity. Emmanuel shows us a different picture he came after us and wants to help clean us up, to change our lives. He's not afraid of our mess. He's not afraid of our sin. Sin is just a way we understand falling short, messing up. Christ is there in the midst of our brokenness to heal us, to make us right, and then be able to stand before God as one of his children. Emmanuel is a picture of God that loves his people so much he's willing to do anything to bring them back. The uniqueness of our faith is we follow God who walked in our shoes. I love that, that hymn, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. This is a message that Christ seeks to be intimate with us, connected with us, and walk in the journey that we're facing. Emmanuel means God understands and so deeply and compassionately cares for us and he cares for this world. And that he made a way when there was no way. And all who claim Christ as Lord and Savior are invited to come. Friends, when the world seems dark and God seems far away, it's the followers of Jesus that are called to bring Emmanuel to reality. You and I not only claim Christ, but we follow in, in his footsteps. And so we offer light in the midst of darkness, kindness in times of despair. You and I are called to be, in some small way, a, a, a part of God's presence in somebody's hurt or loneliness or isolation. You know, this year we've been calling our series through Advent, Embrace. And we've been invited to embrace hope and peace joy and love. But today I hope you'd embrace this idea and this promise that God is with you, that God is with us. No matter where you're at in your journey, you can trust and know that you're never too far from the love of God that's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And friends, as I end our time here this morning, there may be some people here that are seeking that invitation 
to follow. That's one of the blessings of Christ. He didn't force his way on anybody. He just said, come and follow me. If you want to accept that invitation, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a moment. But some of us here may have uh, kind of fallen away, maybe gotten off track, and today is, or this evening is the time when we want to get things right. So I'll lift up a prayer for all of us as well. But if you're that person right now in this moment, you want to accept that invitation to follow Christ, let us all just bow our heads and close our eyes. Will you pray with me? Pray this prayer if you want to accept that invitation to follow Christ. Say this, Jesus, I come to you now and accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I come to you now and accept you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for those times when I've turned from you and turned from that past that I know I should have gone and help me follow you. Help me to follow you and live for you. I ask you into my heart. Take home, take, make your home in me in this moment. Help me to turn from sin and the mess and walk humbly with you. Lord, you know those of us here who have confessed you as Lord and Savior but have stumbled in our commitment to follow you. We ask for your forgiveness and that you might remove the weight of guilt in our lives and that you might collectively create in us a clean heart and renew a right and loyal spirit so we may be used by you to extend hope, to offer peace, to people, be a people of joy and love. And may we all do this, Lord, in the risen name of your Son, Jesus. We ask that you hear us now as we pray in his name. Amen. Friends, I just want to lift up. If, if, you, uh, if somebody here asked Christ into their life in this moment, talk to Pastor Kim or I after the service. This is just the beginning of the journey. And I hope we're all inspired, no matter where we're at, to take this call seriously, to follow Christ throughout our days. May you got, be blessed by this message. Amen. We now come to the time in our service where we celebrate Holy Communion together. And so if you haven't received your communion elements yet, we invite you to just raise a hand and an usher will bring those to you. Let us now join together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And at his birth, the angels sang, Glory to you in the highest, and peace to your people on earth. And so we praise you, saying together, You are the light. You are our God, piercing the dark night. Blessed are the ones, shining their lights, now in your name. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. As Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem and there found no room, so Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was despised and rejected. As in the poverty of a stable Jesus was born, so by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And as your word became flesh, born of a woman, on that night long ago, and so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks to you, and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take 
and eat. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with what Christ has done for us. Friends, as we proclaim the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, and that Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and cup, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, and one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes again, and we feast once more at his heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and in your holy church. Our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Now, friends, as children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught, as together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to take your communion cups, and we're going to open these, and we'll take them all together. So first, open the side with the bread, and then we'll flip it over and op open the juice. Friends, receive now the body of Christ offered to you. The bl blood of Christ poured out for you. Pray with me. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others and do so in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
At this time, I would invite all of you to find your candles. I'd also invite our acolytes and our ushers to come forward. We remind you that as we do our candle lighting, that you take the candle that is unlit and tip that one into the lit candle. As we light our candles, we'll sing together Silent Night. I want to thank you for joining us for our Christmas Eve celebration 
And as we're holding these candles, I'm reminded of Jesus' words to his followers long ago. And I think they apply to us as well. He said, you are the light of the world. And as we prepare to leave this place, go now to share the light of love and peace and hope to somebody who is in darkness. Be a sign of God's love in the midst. And know this, that God is with us all now and always. I hope you have a blessed and Merry Christmas.
We now extinguish our candles, but we know that we will take the light of Christ out into the world. Let us now stand together and sing Joy to the World. Once again, thank you so much for joining us here at East Heights United Methodist Church. And as you prepare to go from this place, may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. May God bless you richly. Amen. <laughs>